welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Good day, Walter. Hello, Martin. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you ask me the same every question time. every time. For 66 times already. Yeah, so this is a bad number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's ask for the Holy Spirit to help us again. Our Heavenly Father, thank you very much for bringing us together again. We ask that you please bless us again and that the Holy Spirit will enlighten our minds, enlighten the viewers, and guide our discussion. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, Martin, we're going down history lane today. Yes. Yes, because we have so many questions about this first day of the week and uh, the rapture and all of these issues. And the mark of the beast mm -hmm. and whether, you know. Yeah, I think there's a misconception. A lot of people don't know the history. We must look at the history. Because once you look at the history, then you get a nice picture of where we are today. Yes. And, and history tells us what the issues were. Mm -hmm. Now, we did one on coercion, right? Correct. And it's always interesting to me, if you find this coercion all the way back in history, then basically you can use coercion as your yardstick and say whether something is from God or not. Definitely. definitely. Yes. Yeah, and I think a lot of um, misconceptions, like I said earlier, will be, get, will be out of the way once you understand where everything comes from. Yes. And that's why so we're looking one at must do a little bit of historic research. Uh, and it's interesting that you cannot trust every source. Yeah. Because history has sometimes been rewritten. Correct. And that's very important. And therefore, you need to know both sides of a story before you can trust the historic account. Especially in the religious environment. Yes. Considering that there was persecution mm -hmm. and ostracizing certain groups, etc. So we have to be very careful what historic sources we trust. Mm -hmm. Correct. So let's look at this issue of preterism, futurism, dispensationalism, who is the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, and uh, talk about it. Let's start off with conservative Catholicism. Yes, right out of the horse's mouth. Right out of the horse's mouth and see what they have to say. Now, conservative Catholicism s clings to Vatican I, the Council of Trent. Mm -hmm. Whatever the decisions were that were made at the Council of Trent, those are the ones that are still ex cathedra from the bishop's seat, infallible. Mm. And everything else that doesn't fit into that mindset seems to be at loggerheads with it. When in actual fact it might not be. Mm -hmm. Because whatever is not ex cathedra could be anything. So Dr. Taylor Marshall has this YouTube channel where he defends the Council of Trent ideology. And he's very much against this openness of the Vatican II popes. We need to talk about this yes, issue we will in some detail. This will definitely lead to, to those lectures that we'll do about that or discussions. Yes. And it's also important for non-Catholics, other Christian denominations, to listen to what he says because there's quite a lot of historical things that he says in this video yes. that can pertain to them. Exactly. So he's going to talk about the temple, the Antichrist, and what the view of Jerome, Augustine. Yeah, the John, Catholic Church Fathers. Yes, John Christodom, Theodoret, Theophylactus, and perhaps Gregory the Great had to say. The second view is the temple... What does the temple mean? The Antichrist? Is it in a building in Jerusalem? St. John of Damascus and Robert Bellamine were of that view. And then he talks about Thessalonians, about the 
sitting in the temple of God, and you are the temple of God. So it's interesting to see what he says from the conservative Catholic point of view. There's two, two camps on this. One, the temple means that the Antichrist, that's the AC, I put AC here, the temple means the AC will be adored in the church. Okay, now who taught that in church history? St. Jerome, St. Augustine, St. John Chrysostom, Theodoret, Theophylactus, and perhaps Gregory the Great. Now, the second view, still on this right here, is that temple means that the Antichrist will be adored in a building in Jerusalem. And the major advocates of that are St. John of Damascus, and St. Robert Bellarmine. Remember, St. Robert Bellarmine is writing against Protestants and all the Protestants. Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, Cramner, all of them believe that the Pope in Rome was an antichrist. So Robert Bellarmine wants to show that, no, the Popes are not antichrist. He has a whole section, I mean, multiple chapters, Robert Bellarmine on it, showing that against Luther and Calvin, no, the, the, the Antichrist shouldn't be in Rome. He should be in Jerusalem. Now, here's the quote here from Robert Bellarmine. He says, uh, St. John of Damascus says, in the temple, not ours, but the Jewish temple. That's John Damascus. And then Bellarmine says, Chrysostom, Theodore, and Theophylactus, who say Antichrist is going to sit in the churches of Christians. But they also say he's going to sit in the Temple of Solomon. All right. Now, I actually find myself siding with St. John Chrysostom here. St. John Chrysostom says that, yes, the Antichrist will have his capital in Jerusalem. Why do we know that? Because all the church fathers say the Antichrist, the final Antichrist, will be Jewish. He will enforce circumcision and he will enforce keeping the Sabbath on Saturday. That is all throughout the Church Fathers. We also know from the book of the Apocalypse that the Antichrist kills the two witnesses, which tradition identifies as Enoch and Elias, kills them in Jerusalem. So it seems that the Antichrist's activity is within Jerusalem. But yet Chrysostom, Theodora, and Theophylactus say the Antichrist is going to sit in the Christian churches and in the Temple of Solomon. And if you think about this, this makes sense. If the Antichrist is going to de is desires to be worshipped by everyone and accepted by everyone, that means that if his capital were to be in Jerusalem, that means that even the so-called Christians, these are the Christians who have faded and moved towards Antichrist, they're also going to acknowledge and worship Antichrist some way. That's what the whole point of the Mark of the Beast is about. St. John Chrysostom says he will command himself to be worshipped as a god and to be placed in the temple, not only in Jerusalem, but even in the churches. All right, so St. John Chrysostom says it's not, it's not just one or the other. It's not like here, one or two. It's actually both. That's how persuasive the Antichrist is going to be at the end of the world. Well, that's a mouthful. But that's basically what the church fathers of the Roman Catholic system taught. Yes. And uh, Cardinal Bellamine, who was a Jesuit, of course, embellished it a little bit in his writings and wanted to make sure that uh, the Protestant view is discarded. Yes. Because after all, you can't have the Pope being the Antichrist, right? Mm, correct. So they made the times of Daniel literal times, which is interesting in itself, mm -hmm. because it means that they recognize that Daniel was speaking about the Antichrist. Yes. All right? Yeah. And uh, it's interesting that they then apply that to a future Antichrist that will come so that the Pope cannot be the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. So here is a, is a whole lot of confusion. And we need, to, we need to look at this very carefully. Yes, because a lot of the Christian world today 
teach the same teachings? Basically all of them. Mm -hmm. And they get very confused. Some of the conservative ones believe in preterism. But we'll, we'll look at that. Mm. So we need to understand where this comes from, why there is so much confusion, and why the world has to believe what these people are saying, because then the heat is off. Yes, of the true Antichrist. The Roman Catholic system. Yeah. So if we go to Daniel chapter 7, where we have the chapter on the little horn, it tells us about this little horn power. In actual fact, it's not a little horn. It's a horn that grew from littleness, but it became more stout than his fellows. Now, if you take the attributes of that little horn power, they are so accurate. When he would arise, mm -hmm. how he would arise, where he would arise, what he would do, he would persecute the saints. He would change times. He would abrogate laws. Mm -hmm. He would uproot up three, root other ones. three kingdoms, etc. There is only one power that fits them all, and that's the Roman Catholic Church. Now, we're not going to give a lecture on Daniel 7. You can put a link in. Yeah. The man behind the mask is one of the lectures on the Antichrist. And then uh, Twin Pillars of the Reformation is another lecture that deals with that kind of issue. But one of the attributes there is that this power would speak great words against the Most High. So he's an Antichrist power. But the word anti also means in the place of. Mm -hmm. So he sits in the temple and uh, we'll read what he has to say. He shall wear out the saints, so he'll make war against God's people. And to think to change times and laws. There's a very interesting wording there, because you cannot change God's law. Correct. You cannot change God's times. They're fixed. Yeah. So it will seem like it. Yes. And everybody will be maybe adhering to, what, to this, but you cannot, cannot change God's. You cannot God's. change it, but he'll think to do it. Yes. So he'll attempt to do it. Now, when you're talking about time, where was time set in motion? In Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, the rhythm of the week was introduced right. and the seventh day was the rest day. That's right? it. That was the rhythm of There's the week. The, that's it. There have been attempts in history to change it to a 10-day cycle, to no cycle at all, whatever. It never worked. The world is at a seventh day, seven day cycle. And then there's this time prophecy they shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and the dividing a time, or a, a year, two years, and half a year. That's how it is translated in other places. So the Protestants used the day year principle and made this prophetic time. So a year in the Hebrew calendar had 360 days. Mm -hmm. So 360 times three and a half is 1,260 days, years. Did the papal power actually rule as a political entity? Because a horn is a political yes. entity for 1,260 years. And the answer is yes. Yes. Because vigilous ascended the papal chair in 538 AD mm -hmm. and took secular power under his control after having eradicated the three opposing powers yes. that the Bible talks about. And then he ruled as a political entity until 1798, exactly 1,260 years. Mm -hmm. And then he received a mortal wound when his secular power was taken away, not his religious power. No. But the Bible says that wound would be healed and he would again be a power to be reckoned with and the whole world will wander Wonder. after the beast. And in 1929, he got his secular power back when the Vatican State was formed and he again qualified as a beast power. Correct. So that is history. Mm -hmm. Now this is the history that uh, was not mentioned in our video at all. 
right? Good. If we go to the uh, history source, here is Christ and Antichrist in Prophecy by Edwin de Kock, and it says, Episcopal elevation laid the indispensable groundwork for the development of the papacy. The second factor favoring it was the fact that the Pope began his career as the bishop at Rome, the imperial capital. The capital had moved to Constantinople. Mm -hmm. In the east. Yes, and so there was a vacancy which was controlled and taken over by Germanic tribes. Mm -hmm. And only when the three opponents were removed could the papacy actually take that power unto itself. No evidence exists that in Priscilla's time, or for the next 80 years, there even was a bishop at Rome. In Paul Johnson's list of pontiffs, we read that Peter's alleged successor, Linus, 67 to 76, was probably an historical person, but still not technically a bishop. Only number 10, Pius I, 140 to 55 uh, after Christ, is designated as such. For those who nevertheless insist that the eternal city must have had a pontiff from the very beginning of the Christian religion, we suggest that her name was Pope Priscilla. He's being somewhat sarcastic. sarcastic. Yes. yes, this Priscilla is the one mentioned in by Paul Correct. in the Bible. Because there's no mention of anything else that is going on there. So this is the, the fact of history that the papacy only really took political power after 538, and this was way before then. And it also, where the papacy says that the first pope was Peter, Correct. this negates that as well. Absolutely. History negates it. Absolutely. And the interesting thing is, of course, the emperors were still ruling hmm. from Rome until the time of Constantinople. And there's a lot of people in other Christian denominations that also say that Jesus handed over the power of the church to Peter by declaring that part of, on this rock I'll build my church. Correct. And we've shown that that's not the case. It's not, he was not the rock. Correct. Let's just look at a little bit of the history of how the papacy managed to assume the powers which it claims to have. Because those powers are nowhere mentioned in the Bible. Yes. Nobody has them, right? Not Peter, no. nobody. Not one of the disciples, nobody. So how did it go from a servant leadership that Christ demonstrate to a rulership? And from being a minister to a priest? Mm. Because a priest is someone who brings a sacrifice. A minister is someone who ministers the word. So this is a very interesting issue. So the priesthood of Aaron, which was a sacrificial priesthood because they sacrificed animals, that came to an end. So how did it become a priesthood again? You had to have a sacrifice mm -hmm. and you had to have an altar. And that's where Roman Catholicism brought in an altar and declared that the Lord's Supper was a reenactment, a literal reenactment of what happened at the cross. And they became priests. And then, as such, they assumed some powers which are totally foreign to the Bible. So here's a little bit of the history. The first one to plant the first peg was Ignatius of Antioch. In the first part of the second century, Ignatius, the bishop of Syrian Antioch, wrote several letters while being escorted under armed guard to Rome, where he was martyred. In his letter, we encountered for the first time an ecclesiology which exalts one bishop over the rest of the presbytery. So now, you had the idea that someone over here was more important than someone over mm -hmm. there. 
whereas we're supposed to be brothers and sisters and on the same level, right? Yes. The next one was Irenaeus, and that was in the second century. He introduced virtual infallibility. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So the early church knew nothing of this. Rome based apostolic succession on Irenaeus. In his Against Heresies, he links bishops through the rite of ordination all the way back to Peter. Irenaeus also developed the concept of infallibility, veritatis certum, and he also developed the basis for Catholic Marian theology. So here you have basically the rot beginning to set in, right? Early. Early. This is the second century already. I mean, the devil's not going to sleep for a century or two. He's going to get to business right straight away, away right? Mm -hmm. The next one was Tertullian, and he develops clarification. That means he makes a distinction between clergy and laity. Now, it's interesting when we discussed Bible translations, mm -hmm. The placing of a comma becomes a very important issue from the apostles and elders and brethren mm -hmm. to the brethren as opposed to from the apostles and elders, comma, to the brethren. Then you have a distinction, yes. right? Not so in the early church. Yeah. Then some are more important than the other. Exactly. So in the New Testament, the Greek word Kleros can mean lot, as in casting lots, or that which is assigned by lot or portion or share. Paul wrote that God has enabled Christians to share in the inheritance, klero, of the saints of light, and Christians as heirs, kleronomi, according to the promise. In this sense, all Christians constitute the clergy. That's biblical. Acts 15, here we have those verses, and they wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren sent greetings unto the brethren, which of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia. That's the King James Version. The modern translations like the NIV, the apostles and elders, comma, your brothers. That's not what it says. Mm -mm. So this is a deliberate distortion to gratify the philosophy of Rome. Yes. So that came in via Tertullian. And then Cyprian was the next one. He elevates the clerics to the position of priest. So this is yeah. quite a while afterwards, right? Uh, Cyprian claimed that the bishop is a sacrificing priest. Both Jews and Gentiles were familiar with the idea of priests and sacrifices, but Cyprian was the first to relate this new religion, Christianity, with the older ones in this way. Basically, Martin, what he did, he got rid of the ultimate sacrifice, which was Christ. Yes. And he reverted back to a type. The earlier doctrine of the priesthood of all believers began to be abandoned and slipped into the background, almost into oblivion. In Cyprian is found the germ of the division of the sacrament into two, so that they gave you the host only and not the wine. That became a major issue in the Reformation as well. The Eucharist, the sacrifice of thanksgiving, the Mass, a new development. And now the bishop became a sacrificing priest, and the bloodless but real sacrifice that he offered was the passion of our Lord. So that's how it crept in. Mm. Then once you had the basis, then you could become prescriptive because you were above yes, the, rest. the rest. So now we must look at the origin of Sunday keeping in history because we have said over and over that the mark of the beast can only be defined by the beast itself. Correct. And the criteria that we have for the beast are such that they only apply to the Roman Catholic system. 100%. That's what all the reformers mm -hmm. taught. 
without and, exception. Yes, and that is what the Bible teaches. Correct. And there were earlier um, proponents of the idea as well, and they were often martyred. Yes. Now, we won't go into all of that history. So this has been coming a long time. And Roman Catholicism, as the beast claims, that the change from Sabbath to Sunday is a mock of her ecclesiastical power. Yes. And we have to look at history to see if this was so from the beginning. Correct. Did the Christians easily go over from the real Sabbath to Sunday? Absolutely. We need to know that. Justin Martyr and others like him found a good deal of common ground between Christianity and Mithraism. Now, Mithraism was the Persian sun, sun god worship. And under the elite, the leaders yeah. of Rome, it had become a favorite, particularly because the way in which it was constructed, how Mitreya, the, the organization of the groupings, how they were run, mm -hmm. that suited their purpose. Imported from Persia, it had begun to strike root in the Roman world by the first century AD. By the second, it was flourishing. So it's interesting, right? In this early Christian period, mm -hmm. there was a shift in Rome from the worship of one deity to the worship of another deity. And the sun god became prominent in the first two centuries. Yes, it's also important to, re to realize that Rome that they're talking about, the Roman world, year was still pagan. That was the pagan Roman world and the emperors and the elite. Its popularity in Rome was practically as old as Christianity itself, for Nero began to espouse it. Two centuries before Constantine, Hadrian, 117 to 38, also identified himself with the sun as is attested by his coins. Many of our current practices come from Mithraism. The 25th of December was the birthday of Mithras. The first day of the week dedicated to the sun was his holy day as opposed to the Jewish Sabbath. This is just History. history. It took the step of shifting the emphasis from the crucifixion to the resurrection, which would always be celebrated on a Sunday. According to Frank Jost, this change originated with Pope Sixtus I, 115 to 125 AD, the bishop or pope of the capital city. So these early bishops weren't really called popes, but they were trying to get stature by aligning themselves with the Roman hierarchy. Yes. So if we continue our history, but this was not at first a weekly observance coming once each week after the Sabbath, as it was later and as it is today. It was annual. Now, this is very important. Mm -hmm. It started with a yearly Sabbath mm -hmm. or a yearly Sunday. If we bring this to modern day, don't we see this happening right now again? Absolutely. Aren't they talking about yearly Sunday? Yes, for the earth. Yes. And then it's supposed to become more and more. Yes. And when you look at Polish legislation, it was first once a month, then it was going yes. to be twice a month, then it was going to be every week. Yes, so and now by, I think, the end of this year, or I can't remember exactly, we did a What's a Prophet, yeah. it, it had to be every year, every, a every, every Sunday. Sunday. This is a strategy that was practiced mm. in historic times already. Uh, it's interesting. That there's a saying, history repeats itself. Yeah, I, I've already told the story of my cat. I had a dog, and the cat always used to sleep on top of the dog. Remember that Correct. story? Yes, yes. And uh, when the dog got old, it had too many pains, and it didn't like the cat sleeping on top. So when the cat tried to climb onto the dog, it would go, Arr! and the cat then would slowly, slowly put one paw after the other and sit frozen for a while 
until she was on top of the dog. This is how they work. This is how it works. So weekly Sunday keeping would grow out of this practice. Anthony Wilhelm, a modern Catholic writer, puts it in a nutshell. Each Sunday is a little Easter. So the annual Sunday became a weekly Sunday. But how did it happen? In the 2nd century, the pagan Romans changed their weekly calendar of seven days. They didn't change the number of the days. They changed an order. Up to that time, their traditional solar deity, who was Apollo, had not been the chief of the gods. Jupiter was the number one god. Consequently, the second day of the week had been dedicated to the sun. The first day was Saturn Day, because they worshipped Saturn, right? But now, because of Mithraism, the sun god had grown much more important. Thereupon, in a bit of drastic calendar reform, the Romans pushed the sun's day back into first position, calling it Dies Solus, Day of the Sun. And this is how Sunday came into existence with a name that, has it, that it has retained to the present. But remember, it was a pagan day. Yes, and that's why I just want to make cl clear here. When they were speaking in a year for, of the first day was Saturn Day. That's in the Roman. That's in the, the Roman, Roman week. That we don't confuse the, it with the biblical don't one. Don't confuse now. this with the no. biblical one. This is pagan history. So now Sunday, Dies Solus, became a Roman day of special significance. So mural pictures in Pompeii and Herculaneum, buried and preserved by lava and volcanic ash from the Vesuvius eruption in AD 79, clearly show the day of the sun as the second day on the calendar. So this is history. Yes. So this is very interesting history. So this is how Sunday came first to the pagan world. Mm -hmm. Then, from a slightly later period, there are several Mithraea, or sanctuaries of the pagan sun god Mithra, which depicted as the first day. So there was the switch. Yes, so they shifted. So what they did is they took their pagan calendar, and now the all week, and now it came into harmony with the biblical week, but they celebrated the first day and not the seventh, like the Bible. Correct, and it was a pagan issue. This change in the weekly calendar of the Romans could be used to bring Christians and pagans together. For both religions held celebrations on the first day. The Mithraics observed each Sunday, and the Roman Christians, it's very important yep. to note that it was the Roman Christians, and we'll see why later, celebrated Easter on it once a year. Soon events would cause them to make an even more drastic adjustment. And this is where it comes in now. In AD 135, at the conclusion of that war, the Second Jewish Revolt, in which many Romans perished, a furious emperor, Hadrian, issued a decree to outlaw Jewish worship, particularly their Sabbath-keeping. You see, when the Jews rebuilt Jerusalem after the first destruction yes. in, in 70 AD, mm. they were constantly... Uh, at loggerheads with the Romans. And in the revolt, they killed many Romans. And Hadrian, the emperor, was furious. Mm. And he decided to eradicate Judaism from the face of the earth. earth yes. So he sent in his soldiers. They totally destroyed Jerusalem in a greater destruction than it had in 70 AD. And he outlawed the Jewish religion. So basically he ended the Jewish statehood and he scattered them and he forbade their worship, which included Sabbath. Sabbath yes. So there came an edict 
against the Sabbath. Nobody was allowed to keep it. Mm. Now the early Christians were in trouble. Yes. What now? Because they kept Saturday. They had an annual in Rome, mm -hmm. Easter. But now they faced the state, the power of the state. And the pressure was on to conform to Sunday. Mm. Yes, because otherwise you get persecuted. So the Bishop of Rome, while he wanted to maintain his position of influence, came up with the idea, well, what if we move over to the Sunday, because we have an annual Sunday, we'll celebrate the resurrection and we'll tell the, the emperor that we agree with Dia Solus, mm. the venerable day of the sun. And so in Rome, they shifted. Later, in Alexandria, they shifted as well. Yeah. But the rest of the Christian world kept Sabbath. Yes, they kept strong. On the, th on the seventh day of the week. Mm. So, this was the first anti-Sabbath law that the church had to face. At that time, believers generally were still observing the seventh day in accordance with one of the Ten Commandments, namely the fourth. Instead of enduring the test, however, the Pope took a radical step. He changed their day of worship to Sunday by extending Easter celebrations into weekly observance. So, that's the history how it came about. Mm -hmm. And this war has been raging ever since. Yes. We know that the church of, in the East kept the Sabbath. We know that the Thomasites, up until the time of the Jesuits, yeah. after the Reformation, still kept the seventh day of the week. And where were they? And they were in India. India. Mm. Yes, because according to them, St. Thomas had come and brought the, the gospel to them, and they were Sabbath keepers. The Celts had kept Sabbath. The Valdenses kept Sabbath right throughout the Dark Ages. The Albigenses kept the Sabbath right throughout the Dark Ages. And there's pretty good evidence that the three enemies, yeah. the Ruli, the Visigoths, and the Ostrogoths, that they also kept the Sabbath, although we don't have that history because okay. we only have Roman Catholic sources left after their destruction. Mm. So this is how the weekly Sunday came in, in Rome. Precedent and rationalization undoubtedly played a powerful role. The state had already demonstrated its ability to change the weekly calendar. If pagan Romans could shift the sun's day from the second to the first, then surely Christian Romans could move the Lord's day from the seventh to the first, and that would solve a lot of problems. Mm. Persecution by the state would then yeah. be over. In this way, the will of the Pope, rather than the Scriptures, became the primary basis for determining what the faithful should believe. And so a mere century after the crucifixion, the pontiffs apostatized, abandoning the idea that the Bible was the sole authority for faith and doctrine. Naturally, some believers in Rome could not accept such a drastic change just because the ecclesiastical leadership wanted it. Therefore, to develop a theological justification for the worshipping on the day of the sun, Christians appealed to God's creation week. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Now they're justifying. They have to rationalize, rationalize it. it. Because the creation of light on the first day provided what appeared to many a providential justification for observing the day of the sun. It's pretty ridiculous because there was no sun on the first day. It yeah. only came on the fourth day, right? Correct. But this is a justification. Martin, do we hear similar arguments today? <laughs> yes, 100%. It's like arguments that the cat dragged in, right? Yeah. Brought it back from 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years ago. And dish it up for you and say, here's a meal. Eat it. Internalize it. Think like us. Wonder after us. Yeah. So the fateful decision to bring in regular Sunday keeping was made in the time when Telesphorus headed the church in Rome. He died within a year of Hadrian's edict. His successor was Hignius, 136 to 49. 
So within the first hundred years, everything was a disaster. John, the last, the last one of the twelve, barely died, and this was already already happening. happening. Now we continue our historic saga. The new day of worship was firmly entrenched by the time of Pius the first, which is 140 to 155 A.D. Uh, you know, I don't like the modern connotation before the common era or mm. after the common era. We'll stick to the old yes. and make Christ the center. <laughs> In his apology, Justin Martyr, a contemporary of Pius I, provided the first Christian rationale for Sunday observance. Now, what did he write? He wrote, Sunday, dear Solace, is the day on which we all hold our common assembly, because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world. And Jesus Christ, our Savior, on the same day, rose from the dead. Anything biblical there? No. Is this argument being used to this day? Today? 100%. And it's only the second part, basically. And, but it's also important to know that Justin Martyr was a Christian. Yes. He was supposed to be the, a true Christian. Correct. Now, had God said, rest on the first day because I made light on the first day, or did he rest on the seventh day? He rested on the seventh day. Okay. So the apology was added, addressed to the emperor Antoninus Pius, about A.D. 50, Justin's word choice is significant. The Mithraic Dies Solus, Day of the Sun, instead of the New Testament Semitic first day of the week. This was intended to ingratiate him and other Christians with this important Roman leader. So this flirting with the state was taking place then already. Didn't you say that flattery in our previous one Correct. is part of coercion. Yes. And Jesus said, Render unto Caesar what is due unto Caesar, and unto God what is due unto God. My kingdom is not of this world. So this is the compromise that led to the Dark Ages eventually. And do you think we will have the same type of compromise now at the end of time? Absolutely. So Justin Martyr was really wasting his time, says this historian, because he was martyred after all, right? Mm -hmm. So Justin Martyr was really a Roman nationalist with syncretic tendencies, right? Mm. Justin shared the anti-Semitism of his compatriots. He argued in his dialogue with Trifo that the observance of the Sabbath was a temporary mosaic ordinance which God imposed exclusively on the Jews as a mark to single them out for punishment that they so well deserve for their infidelities. Now the author here says, what an ignorant man. And that's true, he's being very ignorant here. We hear the same sentiment today. Yes, but what, you know what is interesting, Martin? Here he's saying that it was a punishment for the Jews and the Sabbath was for the Jews. Was there a Jew in the first day of creation? No. No, right? Abraham was not Jewish as either. No. Did you know that the word Jew doesn't actually occur in the Bible? It's just been translated like that even in the King James. It's actually Judean. Yeah. So... This is a very interesting statement. Do you know who else says that the Sabbath keeping and many of the laws were only because of the disobedience of the Jews? Mm -hmm. The Quran. The Quran says exactly the same thing. In other words, ignore God's Sabbath, ignore God's health laws, because the Quran also says that all those health laws, excepting for the pig, mm. only applied to the Jews because of their disobedience yeah, so actually and punishment. the Sabbath too. Yeah, so it's actually a punishment. So actually they are using an old, old argument that comes from those church fathers. Yeah. And then it's sad that 
God said, you must make the Sabbath a delight. Yes. And they make it, it was a punishment. A punishment. Excellent point. This was typical of an entire theology lasting for centuries, a so-called Christian separation from and contempt towards the Jews. Characteristic Jewish customs such as circumcision and Sabbath keeping were proclaimed to be a sign of Jewish depravity. These laws had been instated by God. And they were actually pointing towards Christ. Exactly. So at the Council of Laodicea, now it gets fascinating because now we're at a stage where this power block has grown to the point where it's starting to flex its muscles. Mm. It does not yet have secular power. No, it's only in the religious It has realm. religious power, but it has influence mm -hmm. with the state. So at the Council of Laodicea, sometime between 343 and 381, Catholicism sought to eliminate the observance of the seventh day completely. So it took them 300 years yeah. to try and get rid of it, right? That must tell you something. Correct. By the way, he says, this incidentally is part of the proof that even in those years some Christians persisted in observing the seventh day. So here you have a source, a historic source, because why would they make such a strong decree against it if nobody was keeping it, yeah. right? So yeah. that's why if everybody were adhering to it in the second century already, they wouldn't have to have these councils 200 years later. Exactly. Now, what is interesting... So here they decreed against the Sabbath. Martin, do we have similar things happening today? Are they agitating for a day? Yes. They're agitating for a day. Definitely. Would they be agitating for a day if there was no opposition? Exactly. <laughs> no, they won't. No, they wouldn't, right? So in AD 135, the Pope deliberately separated his church, not only from the Jews, but also from the olive tree of Israel. In other words, he said, we have nothing to do with that Jewish history. That's basically taking a pair of scissors and cutting the Old Testament off and justifying it by using the Old Testament. <laughs> yes. That's circular that, reasoning, that's right? In this way, the pontificate became the Antichrist. It and the system it headed forfeited the covenant rights of Yahweh's Israel, announced to Abraham the fountainhead of blessings for all the families of earth and fulfilled in the Messiah who is also the creator and Lord of the Sabbath, Mark 2.28. So here we have the full catastrophe of how this developed and the mere fact that it came like my cat crawling onto the dog, yes. slowly, piece by piece, shows you that there was a war. And it's interesting what you just mentioned earlier, that currently we see the same thing happening with a day. And it's is it coincidence that it's that same first day of the week? Always. That they slowly, and how did it go? It progressed until it became law. Now we must look at this law very carefully because I've been thinking about this law and we'll see what, what it leads to. So let's go to the Council of Laodicea. As decisive as is this evidence, it is not the strongest that we have to offer. Historians early and late of all beliefs have made much mention of the action of the Council of Laodicea A.D. 364, McClintock and Strong made the following statement. Christostom, now the Americans will say Christostom, in A.D. 360, concludes one of his homilies by dismissing his audience to their respective ordinary occupations. The Council of Laodicea, A.D. 364, however, enjoined Christians to rest on the Lord's Day. This puts it in a very mild indeed. In regard to the influence of the decision of this council, they say, 60 canons were published, 
which were accepted by the other churches. In their synopsis of these, they say, Canon 29 forbids Christians observing the Jewish Sabbath. So here, for the f first time, they are using this term Jewish Sabbath over and over in their official documents. And it's interesting to me, Martin, that they forbid Christians, not Jews, no. to keep yes. the Sabbath. Because you will see that this theology eventually develops where you have two groups. Mm. And uh, let's see where that leads to. In these two statements, we get the whole truth. One, it enjoined the observance of the first day of the week. And two, it forbade the observance of the Sabbath. Let it be remembered that this council was held in less than half a century from the time when Constantine issued his first decree for the observance of the venerable day of the sun as the day of rest from labor. He made a Sunday rest law. Correct. But the Council of Laodicea, the Catholic Church, expanded it to include an anti-Sabbath law. Can we expect the same thing, Martin? Oh, we're seeing the rest day. Um, we've shown it over and over. Yes. The European Alliance for this rest day. Correct. Everybody. Now, as we saw in the first video, it was stated that this so-called Antichrist that was to come, ignoring the one that is already there, was going to force everyone to keep the seventh day as the Sabbath. Yeah. But they don't realize the Christians when they cling to that idea is that according to that theology, the Christians will be gone. Yeah. It doesn't affect the Christians. No, because they'll be ra raptured. Supposedly raptured. Yeah. Yes. Let's use the, the word supposedly. supposedly. Yes, 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 with yes. this secret rapture. So if we continue here with the Council of Laodicea, we read, as the historian says, it was taken from the hands of the emperors by popes and councils and rest enforced upon it as a Christian festival. I will here copy the original as given by the council itself in Latin. Now, the readers can read it for themselves <laughs> and we will translate it in the translation. The following is a translation. Christians ought not to Judaize and to rest on the Sabbath, but to work on that day. So there is the anti-Sabbath Sabbath law. You must work on that day. But preferring the Lord's day should rest, if possible, as Christians. Wherefore, if they shall be found to Judaize, let them be accursed from Christ. That's pretty Straightforward. So this is a Roman Catholic law. And this was Roman Catholic law that was enforced. Correct. So this is an ex cathedra law. So it is infallible. Mm -hmm. We cannot change it. No. And maybe skeptics can just take note of what happened here. Yes. It's not only not being able to do anything on a Sunday for Sunday rest. This was also enforcing people not to keep the truth Sabbath. Correct. So Martin, what was the conclusion of that decision at the Council of Laodicea? The Christian religion had been accepted by the emperors. Mm -hmm. They became the champions. Constantine had introduced the first Sunday rest law. And now by the time of Justinian, it was being enforced. So historically, in less than a century after Leo's decision, Justinian subjected all, whether Jew, Gentile, or Christian, to the Catholic faith, of which the substitution of the Sunday for the Sabbath was a prominent part, of which they had to make a public profession within three months under penalty of being declared infamous, excluded from all employment, rendered incapable of leaving anything by will and having their estates of whatever nature confiscated. Martin, are they talking about legislation of that nature? The World Economic Forum. Exactly. 
All right, they haven't linked it to a day yet, but they're no, no. working on it. Uh -huh. uh, they're working on it because climate change. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. They're working on it. So, if we jump forward to the Council of Trent, where the Jesuits were totally in control. This council took place after the Reformation. And as we saw in previous lectures, many, many things were restored by the Reformation. But even the Reformers yes. themselves argued about the Sabbath issue. And here at the Council of Trent, where they said, the Reformers said, Sola Scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. The Sunday Sabbath issue was the key mm -hmm. as to why Rome could condemn Protestantism. Because the Archbishop of Reggio walked into this council and said, you Protestants, you say Sola Scriptura, but you keep Sunday which is a law of the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Now you can see it in history. We've shown it. Therefore, you are not Protestants. You are rebels. And Rome passed its decrees and negated every tenet of the Reformation. If we go a little bit further to Vatican II, which we will deal with in the next few uh, sessions that we will have, we will see that they never changed one single decree from the Council of Trent. Yes. They can't. It has to be in harmony with the Council of Laodicea. So here you had a mini repeat of that battle, and Protestantism failed. Yes. So basically, at the first Vatican Council, at the Council of Trent, Every single rule and law based on tradition that the Roman Catholic Church had introduced even since that early time was firmly established. They condemned Protestantism on the issue of Sabbath Sunday keeping. And then they had to move further because the Reformation also not only introduced Christ again as the center of the religion and the scripture as the standard, but they had condemned the papacy as Antichrist. Mm. So having condemned the Reformation, they now had to find a counter for this Antichrist label. Yes. Enter the Jesuits with two doctrines, Preterism and Futurism. And it is important for viewers in other Christian denominations to realize Sunday keeping has been coming forth from the Roman Church. Absolutely, even from pagan times. From pagan times. And there were laws that were implemented, especially from the 4th century, that persecuted anybody keeping the true Sabbath. Correct. And so it went on for centuries. And now we get to, like you said, a thousand years later. Correct. So by now, the remembrance of the true Sabbath has been replaced with tradition. Yes. And didn't Jesus in the commandments say, remember the Sabbath? Correct. So maybe it was going to be forgotten, right? Well, let's have a look at these two issues, preterism and futurism. It's fascinating to me that the Jesuit world can put two opposing doctrines into the world out of the same organization and that the Christian world would buy into both. Oh. It's ridiculous no. because they are diametrically opposed to one another. And it's interesting that even within one denomination, often, both are propagated, mm. which is impossible, right? Yeah. So where does preterism come from and what does it say? Alcazar. Alcazar was the Jesuit who, who propounded it. 
By the preterist interpretation, all the prophecies relating to the Antichrist were pushed back in an endeavor to find their fulfillment before the collapse of the Roman Empire. That would set the Pope free and exonerate him from this title. So, preterism claims that the Antichrist was an individual, even though the Bible says many Antichrists, yes. was an individual, and that uh, that was Antiochus Epiphanes IV, a Greek king. The trouble with this theory, of course, is that this little horn power of Daniel comes out of the fourth kingdom, which is Rome. Right. Mm -hmm. So he cannot be a Greek king. So that even anybody should believe this is amazing. I once had a minister from a Protestant denomination come to my house with a young man to try and convince me that uh, the papacy was not Antichrist, he was a preterist. And the young man was sitting there and this man, the, the pastor, was trying to convince me that Antiochus Epiphanes was the Antichrist. So I took the Bible and we went through Daniel chapter 7 and I showed him the kingdoms, and it is very clear in the Bible mm -hmm. that after the Greek Empire comes the Roman Empire, and that this power arose out of the Roman remnants of the collapsed Roman Empire. And I showed it to them in the Bible, and I said, so it can't be a Greek king, it has to be after the Roman era. And eventually he got so frustrated, he closed the ears of his young companion and marched him out of the house. <laughs> he didn't want him to hear those things. So let's just go into this a little bit. So maybe, please, everybody, open your ears yes. and let's listen to this. Listen. Alcázar, a Spanish Jesuit, taking a hint from Victorinus, seems to have been the first, and this is AD 1614, to have suggested that the apocalyptic prophecies did not extend further than the overthrow of paganism by Constantine. It has been usual to say that the Spanish Jesuit Alcazar, in his writings, was the founder of the Preterist school. This is history. Here are the writings of Alcazar. There you see the Jesuit uh, emblem over there. And this was his his view. Now it's interesting that many of the Protestant churches swallowed this hook, line and sinker, mm -hmm. especially the conservative churches. So many of the, of the Calvinist line accepted preterism and taught it in the seminaries. The same with the Lutheran line. They also started accepting preterism as an alternative explanation. Well, once you get rid of the Pope as Antichrist, then you're open to ecumenism, right? Correct. Now, futurism is the opposite. Instead of seeking a fulfillment in the past so that it doesn't apply to the papacy, you seek to a fulfillment in the future, mm -hmm. but the Christian church must be gone because the Pope is associated with Christianity. Yes. Correct. So there was another Jesuit by the name of Ribera. So he took those same prophecies and hurled them off into the future by dislocating the last week in Daniel mm. and with no justification throwing it into the future. Declaring that the Antichrist would make his appearance after the coming of Christ. And Ribera published a commentary in 1585 containing these ideas. Now, Martin, if Christ is going to come to set up his kingdom, then how can Antichrist set up his kingdom after Christ? It doesn't make any sense. So they have to find a reason why Christ abandons the idea and leaves them for a thousand years to do their thing down here, right? Yes. And this is where the rapture comes in. The secret rapture. So now this idea had to be expanded so that the church would be raptured away and then only the Jews would remain and Antichrist would reign down here. So let's look at this. So Protestants today are divided between modernists and fundamentalists. 
Modernists give very little place to the study of prophecy, and fundamentalists are mainly futurists. But some of the old school Protestants are still preterists. Mm. Very confusing. Both Jesuit doctrines. You send twin lies into the world, diametrically opposed to each other, and it doesn't matter to them which one you swallow, because exactly. either way the Pope is not the Antichrist. Yes. So here is a Francisco Ribera. He was a Jesuit doctor of theology, and he was born in Spain. And you see that he, he wrote this even before Alcazar. Yeah. So they came virtually simultaneously, a little bit apart. All right, and he published it in 1590. Here's a quote from the book Romanism and the Reformation. This is the Church of England, view in the 1800s still. To resist the use to which scripture prophecy was put by the reformers is no light or unimportant matter. The system of prophetic interpretation known as futurism does resist this use. It condemns the interpretation of the reformers. This is Church of England speaking in the 1800s. Yeah. It condemns the view of all these men and of all the martyrs and of all the confessors and faithful witnesses for, of Christ for long centuries. It condemns the Albigenses, the Valdenses, the Wycliffites, the Hussites, the Lollards, the Lutherans, the Calvinists. It condemns them all and upon a point upon which they are all agreed. An interpretation of scripture with them embodied in their solemn confession and sealed with their blood. The futurism gets rid of Protestantism. Correct. And Protestants call themselves Protestants and they're futurists. Then what are they protesting against? Yeah. <laughs> they have nothing to protest nothing. against. They're no longer Protestants. Yeah. And they're actually negating that the Antichrist system that Protestants stood up for. Yes. They don't believe it anymore. And then there was one very eloquent bishop, mm. also a Jesuit, of course. The Jesuits are the avowed enemy of Protestantism. And the only reason why we have these doctrines in the world is, is because of their skill in selling a lie. Correct. R Cardinal Robert Bellamine is, of course, now a saint because he achieved so much. Yeah. He was the guy, he was also mentioned by Dr. Taylor in the first video Correct. that we showed. He was one of the best known Jesuit apologists and he published between 1581 and 1593. Can you see this is all coming out at the same mm -hmm. time? And uh, here is the Latin title of what he's saying. And basically it's lectures concerning the disputed points of the Christian belief against the heretics of this time. The heretics being the Protestants, of course in which he also denied the day-year principle in prophecy and pushed the reign of the Antichrist into a future period of three and a half literal years. So the day-year principle is gone, as we said, mm -hmm. and the Christian world swallows this hook, line, and sinker and thinks that they are Protestants. Now, out of all of this then developed dispensationalism, because now you must find a rationale because remember, Christ is going to come, mm -hmm. his church is going to be raptured, and the Jews are going to reign. So how is this going to work? So now you have to do some fancy footwork and come up with this doctrine. So a byproduct of futurism is dispensationalism, by which an endeavor is made to divide history into seven dispensations as taught, amongst others, by Schofield. If you have a Schofield Bible, then it is replete in the comments with this kind of theology. The advocates of this system say that the dispensation of the kingdom follows the dispensation of grace, at which time the Jews will preach the gospel of the kingdom to all the world after the church has been raptured. And during this time, the Antichrist is supposed to come. After entering into covenant relationship with the Jews, he will turn and persecute them, but will later be destroyed by the visible of appearing of Christ at the end of the seven years. So now they've, 
they've modified it and they've created dispensation. Yes, because now they can justify why there's a, rap, a secret rapture and Correct. there's still a kingdom on, God, on earth. So you have the Christian period, which is the grace period, and then you will have the kingdom period where the Jews reign and Christ returns and he reigns from Jerusalem. But the church is raptured and he's gone. Yeah, they stay in heaven. Now this becomes very confusing. All right, so let's look at their theology carefully. Here are the proponents of this idea. Louis Sperry Schaefer, he's founder of the Dallas Theological Seminary, defines dispensationalism in this word. The dispensationalists, believes that throughout the age God is pursuing two distinct purposes. One related to the earth with earthly people and earthly objectives involved, which is Judaism, while the other is related to heaven with heavenly objectives involved, which is Christianity. Well, Fuller defines it a little bit different. He was the dean of the Fuller Theological Seminary. And he says, the basic premise of dispensationalism is two purposes of God expressed in the formation of two peoples who maintain their distinction throughout eternity. So God has two methods whereby he works. One that seems to have failed, which he postpones yeah. and will make succeed at a later stage, and the other one is Christianity. So, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, as you will remember, will tell us that everybody was an individual. We've had this quote many times, so we don't have to repeat it. So you have an individual choice, but here you don't. You have a group choice. Yes. You either belong to that one or you belong to that one. How will it now work if you're a Christian Jew? Then you are exceedingly confused. Uh, but the Messiah that you have as a Christian Jew is not the same Messiah as in Christianity. Because in, in Judaic thinking, the Messiah is a national deliverer and not a deliverer from sin. Now, Ray Dunning, writing in the Beacon Dictionary of Theology, states, dispensationalism's most popular ideas relate to its eschatological teachings, what happens at the end of time. The kingdom of heaven, they say, refers to the earthly nationalistic rule. You see where we're going? Yeah. Which Jesus offered to the Jews, but which they rejected. And thus, God's program for Israel had to be postponed until later. And as an interim arrangement, the church age was ushered in. A further implication of this is the dispensationalist teaching of a secret rapture of the church to remove the church from earth so God can res resume his original plan of establishing a Jewish earthly kingdom. Very confusing. But Jesus was talking about the kingdom of God. He wasn't talking ever about a Jewish earthly kingdom. No, and that's why Jesus, they expected the same when Jesus came the first time. Correct. Nothing wrong with getting it wrong twice, is there? Now, Pastor Kevin Gore is another one, and he says, since you asked why I disagree with the following five pillars of dispensationalism, so even amongst themselves, there's no agreement. And uh, Pastor Gore does not agree with dispensationalism, and he has some very good points. He writes, Dispensationalism's most popular ideas relate to the eschatological teachings, building upon a Calvinistic view of covenant as unconditional. It is deeply interested in national Israel and her relation to the land of Palestine, which dispensationalists insist will be possessed in the end of time for the establishment of an earthly Jewish kingdom in fulfillment of God's promise to David. That's during the millennium. We've got some eruptions going on in, in Israel. Correct. In the news. We must never forget that the Jewish state, as we have it today, is an artificial entity created post-war by 
finance and money coming from the secret societies of the world. Let's just put it simply like that. So if we, if we can state it like this, to uphold this futurism and dispensationalism, they literally, they literally put the Jewish nation there. Correct. To keep this alive. Correct. But it still, in its tenet, rejects Jesus Christ as the Messiah who had come. They're waiting for the one to, to come. come. But the one who is to come is a national deliverer and not a deliverer of the person, the individual, from this evil called sin. So there are five pillars to dispensationalism. Firstly, there's this claim to a consistent, literal interpretation of Scripture. Now, you have a problem there. Because when Israel will reign, then all these ancient nations will serve them, if you take the Bible literally. Mm. But they don't exist anymore. So what do you do now? Do you resurrect them as well, in order to have a literal fulfillment? Secondly, the belief that God has a twofold plan and purpose for mankind, one that specifically concerns the ethnic nation of Israel and one that specifically concerns the Christian church. The one has to believe in Christ and the other one doesn't. The belief that the church is not one with spiritual Israel. So when the Bible talks about the people of God being the Israel of God, mm. that spiritual Israel, they reject that. Yes. They only accept the literal Israel, not a spiritual Israel. The belief in a secret rapture of the church from this earth prior to God resuming his original plan of establishing a Jewish earthly kingdom. So God wasn't successful. He, he yeah. postponed the idea and put something in its place. And then fifth, the belief in a future millennial kingdom of Christ on earth before the ushering in of a new heaven and a new earth. So they have to build a temple mm -hmm. and they must have somebody come in there for seven years to rule. And for three and a half years he will suppress God's people. That's the theology. Well, if they could get a whole nation there, they might as well be able to build a new temple Absolutely. as a diversion. Let's see what they do. But then all attention is on Jerusalem and not on what's happening in Rome. Exactly. This is all being done to take the label of Antichrist away from the papers. Yes. And the enemy sits over there in terms of the many nations that are around that are not of the Jewish faith, neither of the Christian faith, their attention is not directed towards Rome, but towards this other entity. It's a very clever diversion, keeping half of humanity yes. on the one side and the other half in the illusion that the Pope is not the Antichrist. So... Let's see how he sums it up. Dispensationalism insists that the earthly promises which were made to Abraham were made exclusively with him and with his physical seed. Scripture, however, states to the contrary. Romans 2, 28 and 29, he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. This totally negates their theology. Romans 9, verse 6. They are not all Israel which are of Israel. That negates that theology. Galatians 3.29 They that are Christ's are Abraham's seed. That makes the church spiritual Israel. Exactly. Galatians 3.14 That the blessings of Abraham may come on the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. That's spiritual Israel. And Galatians 3.28, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. There is no dispensation. Salvation has been the same from the beginning. God does not change. Mm. Nothing has changed. 
Thus he concludes that the new covenant does not pertain to the physical nation of Israel, but it pertains to the whole family of God, the true Israel of faith. And this is a biblical view. This is a biblical view. So let's just recap again. The Council of Trent established the Roman Catholic doctrine infallibly, cannot be moved. The Second Vatican Council, did it change the Roman Catholic position established at the Council of Trent? Answer is no. We will prove that in subsequent lectures. Nothing has been changed. Only an apparent change. Very clever. Very clever. Like we've seen. They've worked like this throughout history. Millennia. They've, they're not stupid. No, they're not stupid. They know how to do this. So let's look at the remnant of Israel. After their national rejection of the Messiah, the Jews could still be saved as individuals. Though henceforth heaven's appointed agency for blessing and evangelizing the planet would be the Christian church, as Paul announced, and as Peter announced. And there are the verses. The apostle meant that the Christian church originated and therefore continues as a remnant of Israel. And even the book of Revelation still talks about Jews. Yes. It doesn't talk about Christians. That name only originated at Antioch. So when, the, when Revelation talks about those that say that they are Jews or not, this is what it's talking it about. It means the people of God. It was talking to the Christian remnant. Yes. So Romans 11, 1 to 5, I say then, has God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not, what the scripture says of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what says the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. It's very clear. Correct. So it continues. those who accepted Jesus Christ out of the Jews and any Jew who accepts Jesus Christ as his personal savior through all the time periods until the close of probation will be part of the Israel of God. Great. Whether they were literal Jews or whether they were not. So who were the remnant? Originally it consisted entirely of believing Jews, those early Christians. Yeah. Jesus the Messiah is, not was, a Jew. In his only theological argument with a Gentile, the woman at the well of Samaria, he even said salvation is of the Jews. They had the plan of salvation in type. Mm -hmm. Christians have it in verity. That's it. Type had met anti-type. It hasn't uh, replaced. It's a continuation. No. In fact, dispensationalists call what we are talking about now replacement theology. Yeah. And they condemn it. But there cannot be a different gospel no. because Revelation says you have to preach what kind of gospel? The everlasting gospel. Everlasting gospel. No. It never changes. Every single one of the apostles was a Jew. The New Testament is a Jewish book written by Hebrews with the possible exception of Luke. Christianity began in Palestine with the remnant of Israel and not as a Gentile institution. The mother of Christianity was not Rome, but Jerusalem, not the Catholic Church, but the Church of the East. Hopefully this will make it clear. I'm, I hope so. Yes. History clarifies where we are in the stream of time. Correct. So modern history is very important in seeing the progression of the apostasy coming into the church, right? Yes. And we can see that there was conflict. And the church in the East and the church in the West were in conflict with each other as well. 
Now it's interesting that eventually Rome basically succeeded in taking over everything. Yeah. And its liturgies and the way in which they did things started creeping in. But the Bibles were still different. The church in the East used the received text and the one in the West started moving over to the the Latin Bible and uh, the Vulgate, etc., and the translations that mm -hmm. came out of it. And then eventually a split came between uh, the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church, although their liturgies were very similar and they'd already adopted many of the, the things of Catholicism. This split evolved because of uh, an argument about who had supremacy, mm. whether it was the Bishop of Rome or whether it was the one in Constantinople. And so they split. And some issues have still not been resolved to mm. this day. So this is one of the splits that they want to solve. And we need to just briefly, before we wrap up, just look at a few issues that pertain to this history that make it interesting. So let's look at unity between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. So in the recent past, this concept of French President de Gaulle speaking of a European from Calais to the Urals as the real Europe has also been cherished by Pope John Paul II. The jewel in the Pope's international design is a utopian vision of a unified and re-Christianized Europe stretching from the Atlantic to the Ural Mountains, where, of course, the papacy will be supreme, right? Correct. Phase one would be an end to the division between Eastern and Western Europe. Phase two, reconciliation between the Roman Catholics and the Orthodox Christians of the Soviet East. Because originally the, the East was under the, the Bishop of Constantinople, which is today Istanbul, but eventually it shifted to the Greek Orthodox Church where this power was residing. And then eventually when arguments occurred, there was a move even to the Russian patriarch, so they're all a little bit on a different page, but more or less coming together yeah. in these efforts today. This unity has already been sorted out in the political sphere. Correct. And also behind the scenes, it has been sorted out in the religious sphere, but it takes time to make it filter through, to the, through the whole system. Yeah. So... Here is a Catholic news agency. Pope Francis tells Orthodox leader, I'm confident we will achieve full unity. So they're working at it, right? At super speed now. Pope Francis told the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople Monday that he is confident that Catholics and Orthodox Christians will attain full communion. We can thank God that relations between the Catholic Church and the ecumenical patriarchate had grown much over the past century, even as we continue to yearn for the goal of the restoration of full communion expressed through participation at the same Eucharistic altar. They always bring in the sacrifice. That made them priests, right? Mm -hmm. The Pope sends a message each year on November 30 to the Ecumenical Patriarch who is regarded as the successor of St. Andrew the Apostle and the first amongst equals in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Cardinal Kurt Koch, President of the Pontifical Council for the Promotion of Christian Unity, led the delegation. And after the Divine Liturgy, Koch read the Pope's message and presented the Ecumenical Patriarch with a signed copy. So there's this attempt to unify them. So just a few months later, Martin, they come up with this message. Vatican Cardinal supports common Easter date for Catholic and Orthodox. Now, this takes us back in history. Again, because a lot of people won't understand now, so we have to enlighten them. What Just line it up with history again. So this Easter, which was the annual festival, became a weekly festival. That's how Sunday came into the church, right? Mm. 
But the Eastern Church celebrated Easter on a different time. So if you want total unity, then everything has to be in harmony with the one who changed times. Exactly. And who is that? That's Rome. Correct. So now it's fascinating that they're working towards a common Easter day. A representative of the Patriarchate of Constantinople to the World Council of Churches said a common Easter date could be a sign of encouragement to the ecumenical movement. How long has this taken, Martin? Almost 2,000 years. years. Isn't this fascinating? <laughs> yes. And it's all moving towards one point. Orthodox Archbishop Getcha suggested that the year 2025, which will be the 1,700th anniversary of the first ecumenical council of Nicaea, would be a good year to introduce this reform of the calendar. I always like that date because yeah. that's what Alice A. Bailey said when the externalization of the hierarchy would take place. In other words, when demons will manifest themselves. Yeah. Interesting that they're also, again, looking at meddling with a calendar. Correct. He's the one who changes times and laws. Yeah. The first Council of Nicaea was held in 325 decided that Easter would be celebrated on the first Sunday after the full moon following the beginning of spring, making the earliest possible date for Easter March 22 and the latest possible one April 25. Today, Orthodox Christians use the Julian calendar to calculate the Easter date instead of the Gregorian calendar which was introduced in 1582. Now, it's interesting that the Jesuits were behind the introduction of the Gregorian right. calendar and is used by most of the world because the Julian calendar calculates a slightly longer year. It is currently 13 days behind the Gregorian calendar. And just before we get another question on this, nothing of the Julian or the um, Gregorian calendar changed the cycle of the week. Nothing so the changed. Sabbath is still on the Saturday. Correct. So didn't change. Or the that seventh day. day of the week. Correct. Let's not take Roman. It um, shifted the date, but it didn't change the cycle of the week. Now, let's just go to another interesting statement, just to put another little bit of information in there. Now, if you go to um, Wikipedia, you will find this definition. Now, this definition is in many sources, historic sources, mm -hmm. but just to show the readers that we can use a, a modern open source even, and even that can have information in that applies to this argument. Correct. And you will see how important it is. Mm -hmm. Here is a term which is called quarto decimanism. What does that mean? The quarto deciman controversy arose between Christians in the churches of Jerusalem in Asia Minor, observed the Passover on the 14th of the month, Nisan. Now, Nisan is the first month in the Jewish calendar, and it starts with spring. No matter the day of the week on which it occurred, because they determined it by the lunar cycle. Yes. So... This was a month issue. When did the month start? It had nothing to do with the cycle of the week. Nothing it had to, to do, do with a month. Yes. While the churches in and around Rome changed to the practice of celebrating Easter always on the Sunday, following the first full moon, following the vernal equinox, calling it the day of the resurrection of our Savior, the difference was turned into an ecclesiastical controversy when the practice was condemned by the synod's bishops. So now let's just get this straight, Martin. The Jews under the Pharisees, and remember Paul says in his theology, as far as these things are concerned, he stands by the Pharisees, right? It was against the Sadducees. Now, the Pharisees, calculated the 14th, that's why they were called quarto decimanists, those who kept the 14th, 14th day, 
that day was determined by the appearance of, of the new moon. And it could take place any day of the week. Mm -hmm. So every year it could shift to another day. But Rome decided, no, it had to be a Sunday, the first day of the week. It's interesting that the Jew Jewish Sadducees also were inclined to have it as the first day of the week. So they were at loggerheads with the Pharisees. So now an argument arose. This just goes to show how important this annual Sunday was to them. Yes. Because the annual Sunday of Easter was the door that opened up the possibility of the weekly Sunday of the disputes about the date when the Lord's Supper should be celebrated, disputes known as Paschal Easter controversies, the Quator Decimen is the first recorded. So they argued about this. In the mid-second century, the practice in Asia Minor was for the pre-Paschal fast to end and the feast to be held on the 14th day of Nisan. This is the Church of the East. This is where the true church was. Mm -hmm. Christians, They're Christians. Were, yeah, they were first called Christians at Antioch, not in Rome. Yeah. When the barley was found ripe after the new moon near the Jewish lunar month of Nisan, no matter the day of the week on which it occurred, the date on which the Passover sacrifice had been offered when the second temple stood, and the day when the people put away the leaven, those who observed this practice were called Quarto decimani, Latin for fourteenth. Because of holding their celebration on the fourteenth day of Nisan. So when they changed this calendar, to bring it in line, by the way, with the pagan calendar and the Feast of Isis, mm -hmm. or the Feast of Ishtar, which became Easter, Again, the one changing the times and the laws is Rome and nobody else, no future Antichrist who will come. This issue was important. So now they celebrate Easter and the crucifixion always on a Friday and the resurrection always on a Sunday. It was not the case in the early church. Yeah. And they, like we've seen, that's why when the weekly uh, Sunday keeping came in, they called it a mini Easter. Correct. So now let's just go back to history. An early example was the demand by Pope Victor. This is now 189 to 99 after Christ. That all should celebrate Easter on Sunday. See the history? Confirmed now there in a modern open encyclopedia. He went further. He excommunicated the Christians in the Roman province of Asia who continued to observe it on Nisan 14 because that would get rid of the annual Sunday, yeah. Easter, right? The date of the Jewish Passover. The papal invention of Easter Sunday was tinged with paganism. Nevertheless, at the Council of Nicaea, the Emperor Constantine supported it and imposed it on all its territories. So he got rid of the original biblical times and introduced his own times. Not a future Antichrist, the Pope did it. Yes. It can happen because the, the biblical one changes over time, right? And it can be on any time of the week. But occasionally it can actually coincide mm. with the same time that Rome has. But Rome wants to distance itself from the biblical way and enforce its way that it is on a Sunday and a Sunday determined by it, not the Bible. Correct. This is actually an arrogance. No, this is 100% directly opposing God. Exactly. Yeah. So now, in 2001, what happened was they coincided and the Pope who was on the throne at the time, was Pope John Paul II. So what did he do? As in previous occasions, he shifted the solemnity of Easter by a week and the entire Western world followed him. Yes. Not thinking, how can you move this by a week? Isn't that changing times? Yes, it's changing. Even <laughs> within his own system, he changed his own times. 
So in 2001, uh, the writer says he was completing this book. Full moon fell on the Sunday, the 8th of April, which coincided with the Jewish Passover. Easter was therefore be delayed a week and celebrated on Sunday, the 15th of April. So Catholicism and its theological kindred boasted against the olive tree of Israel. Quite deliberately, they detached themselves from it, and God has honored their decision. Do what you want. Mm. I will give you permission to change that, or I will allow it. But people must decide. How much blood has flowed over history, yeah. over this issue? Let's go back to Wikipedia. The practice had been followed by Polycarp, who was a disciple of John the Apostle. So Polycarp had received his instruction directly from John the Apostle, and he kept the 14th yep. day. And the Bishop of Smyrna, one of the seven churches of Asia, and by Melita of Sardis. Now Irenaeus, we've heard him before, says that Polycarp visited Rome when Anicetus was the bishop, and among the topics discussed was the divergence of custom with Rome celebrating the Easter always on Sunday. So now we're going back right into history, right to the source. Here was an argument. The one group was keeping it the Bible way. The other one was keeping it the Roman way. According to Eusebius, now Eusebius was a Gnostic. Yes. He was a follower of Oregon. Oregon. He was a contemporary of Constantine. And he's probably the one who wrote much of the Bible in such a way that it could be of ecumenical value, bringing pagans and Christians together. And uh, maybe the manuscripts that were yeah. found that Sineticus, the Sineticus is one of these uh, modified versions by this Eusebius fellow. So in the last decade, a number of synods were convened to deal with the controversy, ruling unanimously that the celebration of Easter should be observed and be exclusively on Sunday. So Rome put down its stamp. Synods and conferences of bishops were convened and drew up a decree of the church in the form of letters addressed to Christians everywhere that never on any day other than the Lord's day should the mystery of the Lord's resurrection from the dead be celebrated, and on that day alone we should observe the end of the Easter fast. This controversy has been raging a long time. They're going to nail it now. Mm -hmm. They're going to bring it to a point. So these synods were held in various places, the council in Rome presiding by its bishop, Victor, took place in 193 and sent a letter about the matter to Polycrates of Ephesus and the churches of the Roman province of Asia. So within the same year, Polycrates presided over the council of Ephesus, attended by several bishops throughout that province, and they rejected Victor's authority and kept the province's partial traditions. So the church in the east said, no, we're not going to do what Rome says. We're going to stick to the Bible. So what did he do? He excommunicated them. them. Yeah. <laughs> that seems to be a way to do it, right? Yeah. You're not going to become. You're not going to be able to buy. You're not going to sell. sell. I'm going to throw you out. Exactly. Polycrates emphatically stated that he was following the tradition passed down to him. We observe the exact day, neither adding nor taking away. For in Asia also great lights have fallen asleep, which shall rise again on the day of the Lord's coming. That's interesting. So what did they believe on the resurrection? That um, they, at Jesus' coming, the dead will be raised again. Exactly. So all these observed the 14th day of the Passover according to the gospel, deviating in no respect but following the rule of faith. And I also, Polycrates, the least of you all, do according to the tradition of my relatives, some of whom I have closely followed. For seven of my relatives were bishops, and I am the eighth, and my relatives always observe the day when the people put away the leaven. Quite clear, this controversy has been raging for 2,000 years. 
So now the question is, will history repeat itself? Let's quote again from the source that we've been quoting all along by Edwin de Kock. Nonconformity has ever been the badge of the persecuted, while their oppressors often belong to a religion or ideology supported by the state. The hardship that the Christians experienced often did not originate with the emperor, but with their neighbors who stirred up trouble. You know, I yeah. can't resist stopping there for a while. Yes. <laughs> uh, are we experiencing similar things? Yes. Where is the problem of being handed over to the authorities? Yes, your neighbor is going to hand you over. Tell us about these things they're saying. To these, the followers of Christ were atheists, since they would not worship the Roman gods or venerate images. According to Robin Fox in his book, Pagans and Christians, the pagans believed that this was very bad for their gods were supposed to be extremely jealous of their rights. If anybody dishonored them, they could turn very nasty and punish the whole community with famine, plague, or drought. No rain because of the Christians became a common saying. Martin, do you think they could say that the climate change catastrophes can be blamed on those who refuse to conform to Roman laws? Do you think it's a possibility? In 161, Marcus Aurelius assumed the purple, the emperor's view of life, were also singularly enlightened. For instance, he referred to the idea of a polity in which there is the same law for all. A polity administered with regard to equal rights and equal freedom of speech and the idea of a kingly government which respects most of all freedom of the governed. Now, what's interesting, Martin, is that today they say the same thing, yes. provided it is in harmony with the common, common good. good. Yeah. Here, he seems to be anticipating some of the principles which more than 1,600 years later came to adorn the American Bill of Rights and are justly admired all over the world. We would have expected this emperor to be more tolerant than the rest of the Romans, but he was not. For it appears that Christian blood flow more profusely in the principate of Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher, than it had before. I think it can happen again, Martin. Yes. I think it's important to realize, although that leader might seem... So kind and so liberal. Don't underestimate them. Correct that he, of all the ancient Romans, could also be the relentless persecutor has perplexed his admirers in after times. We must simply accept that however much the ideas and even the life of Marcus Aurelius resembled those of the Christians, he regarded them as enemies threatening the stability of Rome. We can only ponder the tragic fact that persecutors, doomed to perdition, are often highly respectable and apparently virtuous people. The deception runs so deep. And today we have a system where the moral leaders of the world are embracing all those pagan ideologies, in placing it into the books of the legislature, and telling the world to conform for the common good. May God give us wisdom, because if we understand this, mm -hmm. this issue, then like those early Christians of the East, we will say, thus says the Lord. The issue will be the weekly Sabbath. The others have been sorted by them, but the cycle of the week has not changed. Cannot. So, the weekly Sabbath is going to be the issue. May God give us wisdom. Amen. Heavenly Father, we have taken a walk through the corridors of history. This issue has been coming a long, long time. That Antichrist power that assumed the power to change times and laws 
is now gathering his people from the east and from the west. And may there be a people worldwide that will oppose him and says, thus says the Lord, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe to our channel, click here. To get notifications, click on the bell. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you and we'll see you again.